it always bothered me that all this money is being made. And when a player said, well, how come we can't participate in, in this business? They would say, hey, if you want to get a job, go get one. So they were actually okay with us working and getting paid, just not working and getting paid in the industry that they're getting paid in. Amateurism never helped me. It didn't make me a better person, didn't make me a better student, didn't make me a better athlete. It just restricted me. My next guest on Soup with Coop is a four-year starter at Duke, is a two-time national championship coach, is a lawyer, a broadcaster, a journalist, a tweeter, and a lover of soup. We'll find out if he's a lover of Coop. Welcome to the show, Jay Billis. Cooper, thanks for having me. It's an honor. It's an honor to eat soup with you. Are you a big? I mean, do you love soup? I mean, that's the word on the street. But do you? Are you an avid soup eater? I like soup as long as it's a, a heavy soup. I don't like light soups or cold soups. I like hot soup, and it has to be a heavy, substantial soup. And today, what are we having? We are having a New England clam chowder today, and yours looks insubstantial, by the way. <laughs> Jay, we're not off to a good start in the fact you're already accusing me of not having New England clam chowder, but you must be an expert because I was struggling this morning and I'm stuck with a mediocre bowl of chicken and wild rice. So I apologize yeah. for not <laughs> delivering, you know, answering the bell. I'm a, I'm a fraud. Yeah, it's a difficult to get up in the morning and find good New England clam chowder. That's why I did mine in advance. Do you ever stray and go completely off the wall and have a little Manhattan clam chowder? Have you ever done something? Like no, that? no, I'm not a big vegetable eater. So Manhattan clam chowder has too many stray vegetables in it and is too close to like minestrone or something like that. I like, uh, I do tend to go to, I'm not a creamy food person, but I like lobster bisque. I like, I like creamy soups for some reason. I like uh, tomato basil soup when it's creamier and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm de destined to be a fat old man because of it. I was doing some research on New England clam chowder, and I'm sure this is what influenced you, but it really, it was popular, got popular in the 1700s, but really got popular when it was featured in um, Herman Melville's Moby Dick, which is around the you know, mid 1800s. I'm sure that was probably the big influence for you. That when I first read Melville, that's <laughs> when I started getting into clam chowder. I was going to other soups. Um, uh, I was, you know, big into gruel early on because of Dickens, and then Melville got me to uh, to clam chowder. So that, that's very astute of you to pick that up. You had no idea this was going to be an English two hundred one class, did you? Yeah, uh, I didn't go to I didn't go to any of my English classes. I went to Duke, <laughs> so we didn't have we didn't have to attend class. Actually, is it is it harder to stay in Duke than it is to get in Duke, or other way around? Duke's a little bit like Ole Miss. Easy to get into, hard to get out of. Mm -hmm. That's the only time anyone's ever compared those two institutions. <laughs> I do appreciate it. Looking back, when you're a young recruit out of California, a six-eight prospect, you know, a, a highly recruited prospect, and Coach K is—they're not, you know, ten people in the world that know who Coach K is outside of Durham. What gave you the uh, the insight to say, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my career in the hands of this young man," and, you know. 40 years later, he'll still be coaching and be have five national championships. Well, honestly, I didn't think about nor care about the 40 years later part. I only cared about the four uh, of mine. And uh, maybe that that's selfish, but it's all I really thought about. And I didn't have a particularly good experience with my high school coach. And I really wanted to have a, a, a positive experience in college. And I, it, it, I realized at that time at 17 years old that that was the only time in my basketball life I was going to get to choose who I played for. And so I really took the recruiting process seriously. And I, and more than anything, I was choosing a coach, not a school. And I know like folks probably wouldn't want to hear that. You know, they, they think that you should choose the school that's right for you and everything else takes care of itself. But for me, it was the opposite that choose the coach you want and everything else will take care of itself. Cause if I wasn't happy in my basketball life, I wasn't going to be happy with any aspect of college. And oddly enough, Cooper, I came down to, so uh, Coach K was on that list. Uh, Lute Olson was at Iowa at the time. And that was, he, that was my second choice. And then Jim Beheim at Syracuse and a guy named Ted Owens at, uh, at Kansas. Those were the four coaches I liked the best and the four I came down to. 
And oddly enough, like all four of them have been final four coaches and hall of fame and all that stuff. Um, but I couldn't have imagined that coach K would be all of that. Uh, not only all he would accomplish, but he would be all of that to me. And we've all got a bunch of friends who, who have, you know, they love their coach, but when the coach left, got fired, whatever, uh, their relationship with the school was diminished a little bit. And that hasn't happened for, for, for me or for us. And that's, that's pretty lucky. No, I think you're right on that. Most people um, who have played played somewhere, and then obviously things change a ton more now, but really the most consistent person within an athletic program is usually either the equipment manager or the trainer. And that's the guy that, you know, you latch on to, oh, possum still at Ole Miss. I can always go get a pair of shorts if I'm, you know, if I'm working out and need an extra pair of socks or something. And, that, and then but they've been, you know, it just – it's lucky for a recruit now, Jay. I mean, looking back at your experience, to even by the time he figures out who he wants and even finishing his career, be under the same same coach, much less the same staff. Yeah, if and especially in basketball, if they stick around at all, um, I would have had to have stuck around. But um, you know, some of the really talented players they leave early. They're not thinking about that relationship as much. But you know, I, I part of me, Cooper, thinks I got really lucky. And then the other part of me was, I, it was a, it was a decision that was easy to make because coach K was so trustworthy. Um, I didn't have to, I wasn't looking at his resume and I wasn't uh, maybe blinded by the shine of, of what you might be blinded by now. Not that you'd make a bad decision as a result of it, but at that time, I mean, I, I kept coming back to, I like him the best. I mean, I trust him the most. And, uh, and it was a, a relatively easy decision in that regard. And, you know, back then, I'm older than you, but back then, um, when, you, when you signed, you didn't sign till April. And so I, I committed in December because I wanted recruiting over with. When I knew I was tired, I didn't want any more phone calls. I didn't want to talk to anybody else. I, I, I did not enjoy the recruiting process from the uh, selling points. You know, it was kind of like you're being sold a used car all the time. And I didn't like being pursued that way. But um, once I signed, uh, I, was, I was really happy because then I knew it was completely over. Because uh, even, even in April back then, March and April, when coaches would get fired, the new guy would come in and say, hey, you want to change your mind? You know, we get a new sheriff in town, all that stuff. And I, I just, I did not enjoy that at all. I'd be curious how you enjoyed from the other side when you joined Coach K's staff recruiting kids. Was that challenging did you enjoy that part any more than being recruited itself well recruiting was easy for me because I was a graduate assistant so the only thing I did was you know you might uh meet recruits and and squire them around on campus but I did not have to do off-campus recruiting as a graduate assistant and so I was pretty happy about that Tommy Amaker Mike Bray they were the the chief recruiters so um you know those guys did all that stuff uh, I was one of the guys that would maybe once in a while pick up a recruit at the hotel and, and get them to, to breakfast with coach K before they went to the airport or something like that. And, uh, and, you know, I remember sitting one time, um, at breakfast with, uh, uh, I was one of the guys with Chris Weber, uh, mm. when he was being recruited and, and looking at him going, man, if whoever gets this guy is going <laughs> to win a lot of games. Uh, he was, he was a stud. <clears throat> Did you know when you were coaching that you, we're not long for coaching. I mean, you won two national championships in three years. Um, did you think, I, I'm, I think I want to get on the other side of basketball? I, I thought I would stay with coaching. Because what happened, I played pro ball for a few years in, in Italy. Um, that, that was, you know, sort of my level. And uh, after about three years of playing over there, Coach K called me and offered me a coaching job. And uh, he had a position open on his staff. And, and I had applied to Duke Law School. Uh, thinking that whenever I was done playing, whether it was six years, 10 years, 12 years overseas, I'd go, go to law school. And so he, uh, he offered me this, this job. And I thought, you know, this is a good opportunity to get into coaching at a good level. And so I took the, took the position. I got admitted to law school at the same time. And it was his idea that I do both, that I coach and go to law school. And uh, so I did that. And I thought I, early on, I thought I would, I would, choose coaching as a profession. Cause I didn't really want to, <clears throat> excuse me, didn't really want to be a lawyer. Right. I wanted the law degree. And so uh, when, when my wife and I got married, uh, when we got engaged, we kind of talked about what's the right 
what's the right thing for our family? Not necessarily what, what did I want to do or what did she want to do? What, do, what do we want to do? We thought coaching would not be the best for a family because we'd be moving all the time. And, and uh, you know, I'd, I'd probably get fired a lot and be looking for other <laughs> jobs and all that stuff. So, so we, we settled on being a lawyer and then broadcasting came after that. Caesar's Sportsbook, it's not just an app, it's a whole empire. Iconic casinos, hotels, world-class restaurants, it's all yours with Caesar's Rewards. Because every bet you place, win or lose, earns reward credits, which you can redeem for hotel stays at over 50 destinations, meals, tickets, merch, bonuses, and more. Get started today. Create an account with promo code Omaha Full. You know what goes well with a hearty bowl of soup with coop? How about a delicious delivery of Omaha Steaks? It just warms my heart when I get mine. The quality, the convenience, and Omaha Steaks works for any occasion, especially a backyard barbecue. And that's perfect because spring is in the air, and that can only mean one thing, spring grilling. The steak experts at Omaha Steaks have made it easy to spring into something delicious with their semi-annual sale. With 50% off site-wide, grab all your favorites. I especially love the juicy burgers. Plus, when you go to omahasteaks.com, use the promo code SOUP, S-O-U-P, at checkout, and you'll earn an additional $30 off your order. That's right. I'm giving you the hookup. Don't wait. Go to omahasteaks.com, use the code SOUP at checkout, and take advantage of this deal. Omaha Steaks is ready to ship your order right now, and you're going to want to hurry because it's only happening for a limited time. Visit omahasteaks.com. Use soup at checkout. Don't miss your chance to save. Minimum order may be required. First gig right out of the gates is, is actually calling games at Cameron Indoor. And if anyone's never been there, I've only been there one time. I went up several years ago and I went to a Duke UVA game. The one where Grayson Allen hit the shot at the end, may have traveled, yeah. may have not. It was fantastic. Brought my boys and it's just one of the great bucket list things that, you know, you talk about, but you finally do. And uh, to be, to play in there, to compete, to sit on the bench and then to call games is um, that's, that's pretty magical. It was, it, it's been really cool. Um, and the more uh, like having kind of grown up there as a basketball player, practiced there every day and, uh, and played there. And then my broadcast career started there. Uh, so I started doing games there um, while I was practicing law and I, I really did it just to get out of the office. I thought it'd be fun, uh, but I wasn't sure where it would lead and it led to something nice and that was great. But early on, I think it, it, it really helped my broadcast career uh, because it was right after I'd coached there. So I knew all the plays. I knew everything they were running, including like what they were running an out of bounds play. So I'd say, hey, you know, Chris Collins is going to get this shot. And then he would get it. And people thought, oh, my God, you know, this guy, know, oh, how does he know that? And I was like, well, I was there last year. I know. Yeah. But then as you know, and you knew what the opponents were running. But then as the years go on, the amount of work it would take to know all that stuff, the amount of film you'd have to study, I would never be able to get out of the house if I did all that. Coach K, as, as everybody knows him, I mean, he's, he's, always, he's pretty accessible. He has his own radio show. But he's still kind of a mystery how he can be – so patient and seems like, I mean, he gets mad clearly, but he's handled so many different egos and such. And, and I, I was curious, does he handle every single person differently? Or is it just, this is the way coach K does it. And you either buy in or you don't. Cause it's, he's had personalities come through Durham that have, um, and talents that probably needed some massaging. Yeah. That's a great question. I mean, he, um, well, one, he's not as patient as he comes across, uh, you know, he, he and that's a good thing, because whenever there's an issue that needs to be dealt with, he doesn't let it go. If it's a small thing, he handles it right away. So it doesn't become a big thing. And he doesn't really worry about how uh, like he'll handle people's emotions with it. But he doesn't worry about if he's going to step on somebody's toes or, you know, kind of derail the train a little bit and go in a different direction, as long as it, it, it's better to get the train to the ultimate destination. And your question about, does he handle everything the same? He's got principles that he doesn't budge on, but he treats everybody uh, according to the way they should be treated. So it's like the thing about, um, you know, I'm, I'm fair, to, I, I'm not gonna treat you the same, but I'm gonna treat you fairly. So everybody gets treated fairly, but it's not the same. So, you know, maybe, maybe one guy, 
is is better motivated by getting on him so he'll get on that guy the other guy's better motivated by you know putting your arm around him and all that stuff i was the i was the one that uh, was better motivated by screaming at him and calling him names uh, i would have preferred to be the guy that got the arm around uh, treatment with whisper in the ear but um but he's great like christian he coached christian leitner differently than others and there are some guys that um that he would have to like build build their ego up like he wants big egos uh, like I remember him talking to the Olympic team saying, you know, don't, don't go buy into this, check your ego at the door thing, like bring your ego with you. He goes, I want big egos and, and egos of good players, but just be prepared to blend your egos for the, the common good, that kind of thing. Um, Cause there are a lot of good, there are a lot of good me's in there. It's not, you know, you want a we mentality, but but there are a lot of good me's in there. So you want you want I've always put it we over me, but not exclusive of me. You know, that, that I think that's the way he goes about it. He doesn't say it that way, but that's the way I would would characterize it. Because he's coached on Olympic teams. I mean, the biggest star, I mean, you know, when you're coaching Jordan and Pippen and, you know, Ewing and I mean, it's that's I would I would think that would be an adjustment for a college coach who is, you know, molding men that all of a sudden you know at the at the next level to kind of you know you're dealing with um full-grown men that have been there that are not as easy to i guess maneuver yeah i mean i saw a few practices not a lot when, when they would be in vegas and i think the biggest difference in the olympic team and then his team was the amount he didn't have to teach as much um with the olympic team and they didn't go as long uh, so the, the amount, like he would ask them how long you want to go, stuff like that. So they, they, they wouldn't practice as long. It was a totally different scenario. Um, but, but the, the team stuff that he had with them, like he had one thing that I, I mean, I tell this story a fair amount, but, uh, it's, it, it was really impactful on me. Uh, coach K and I had to go to some event in Las Vegas while they were training camp. And, uh, and so I got, he said, meet, Hey, we're having a team meeting, meet me here and, and we'll leave after the meeting. And I got there early to make sure I was on time and the meeting hadn't started yet. So he says, come on to the meeting. So they, he's talking you know, he's got Chris Paul and Paul George and all these, you know, all these guys in there, Russell Westbrook, LeBron, you name it, the, the best players in the league, Kevin Durant. And he, he finishes the meeting and he says, all right, when you guys get back to your rooms, your hotel rooms, there's going to be something waiting in there when you get back and it's going to be your, your USA Jersey. And he said, look, all of us got our first Jersey at one point in our lives, whether it's your little league Jersey, your first varsity high school Jersey, those of you that played in college, your first all-star Jersey in the NBA, whatever it was. And he said, I want you to take the Jersey and lay it out on the bed. And I want you to look at it and think about how cool this is and, and how we, you know, we get to do a lot of really cool things in our, our lives. And, and sometimes if you're not careful, you can take it for granted. And, and he, he said, don't take special for granted. You know, don't take special for granted. And I, I really thought about that a lot. It blew me away that he would say that to those guys and that they, they received it that way because it really made it, I, it, it seemed to make an impact on them. But I started thinking about it in my life. Like when I go to these arenas, you're talking about like Cameron or, you know, you go to the Breslin Center at Michigan State or uh, Allen Fieldhouse at Kansas, whatever. You know, am I am I looking at that like the first time I walked into those places, I was in awe and and so grateful for the opportunity. Am I still looking at things that way? Am I taking special for granted? And he's really good at that stuff. Like he's so good at, at getting you to think about what's important. And, you know, he's not going to X and O you to death. He's going to he's going to reach you at the right level. And it's it's that's a pretty amazing uh, quality he has as a coach and a person, really. I think I might need a little life coach action myself. I'm always kind of <laughs> looking forward to the next thing and quit, you know, get to really soak up and embrace and um, realize how special things are. That's 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 neat that he does that, and it's neat that he can have that sort of impact on those on those uh, talents he surrounds himself with. That's I, I always just. You know, there are coaches that are mysteries, and Coach K is still kind of a mystery because I'd love, you know, you always want to, <clears throat> you see him, you think you know him, but getting in the locker room, especially being in practice when he's, you know, when he's after you, when y'all are dogging it one day, I'd, I would like to experience that one day. I had a coach who was kind of a Bobby Knight clone. I was the guy, just like you, Jay, that got the wrath, you know, 
Randy Livingston misses a shot and he yells at me for, you know, not having my shirt tail tucked in. I'm like, what the heck? How's this working? But I guess that we know our role, don't we? Well, uh, and it was, it was, uh, it was not always pleasant, but, but the funniest stories came from that. So, so oftentimes when I get together with my teammates, uh, the stuff that was said to me is brought up, brought up first. So at least I've got that in my back pocket. So I got it to, to, you know, quote of uh, Caddyshack, I got that going for me, which is nice. Love the convenience of getting what you want right to your door? With DoorDash Grocery Delivery, you can stock up for the week or order last minute cravings conveniently. You've trusted DoorDash to deliver your restaurant favorites, and now you can get grocery delivery that actually delivers too. With thousands of grocery stores to choose from, you'll find the best in your neighborhood and boost your local economy with each and every order. You'll get exactly what you've ordered or we'll make it right. So sit back and enjoy quality groceries just like you picked them yourself. And want even more value? You can save on all grocery and restaurant favorites with a $0 delivery fee on all eligible orders with a Dash Pass membership. With easy substitutions right in the app and best-in-class customer support, DoorDash delivers groceries exactly how you want it. Get 50% off your first DoorDash order up to a $20 value when you use code SOUP at checkout. Limited time offers, term may apply. That's 50% off up to $20, no minimum subtotal, and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter code SOUP. Don't forget, that's code SOUP for 50% off your first order with DoorDash. Now, Jay, you've been very outspoken, and I'm, I'm, I'm really curious on your, when this started, your stance on the idea of amateurism being kind of a sham going forward and players in college being paid, assuming they're in students, they're, they're remain in good standing on the, on the student side. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And I have some questions because I don't understand it all. Well, Cooper, it started when I was in college. I was a member of the NCAA's Long Range Planning Committee. I was an athlete representative on that committee. And they probably regret letting me in there because I learned how everything worked. And I learned how policy was made and what was behind it. And then I also had the experience as a player understanding that while, while they talk about amateurism like this, like, like it's virginity or, or something, um, what's really going on is every good player in football and basketball is ineligible according to the rules, because everybody, at the, especially at that time, and I know at this time, has taken something. Like even, even as little as, you know, you're, you're in Oxford, I'm in Durham, you can take your girlfriend to a restaurant that you go to a lot, the owner of the place says, no, this, this one's on us. Um, technically, that's against uh, amateurism rules. And, and, you know, there are other things. I mean, heck, when I was in college, um, and in the 70s, 80s, into the 90s, players in, in, the, in the ACC and other leagues, they sold their tickets. Yeah. Um, they got complimentary tickets. They sold them. And yeah. that happened everywhere. And the coaches all knew about it. The administrations knew about it. Um, that was the way the world worked. And so all, there are a lot of people out there that are your age and my age that are on the other side of this philosophically than I am that are out there talking about the purity college sports. I'm going... I know you sold your tickets. Yeah. Like what Not for are face you value. About? Not for face yeah. value, Jay. And, but, but, but anyway, so that, that kind of thing, I always felt like it was a sham in a lot of different ways, but it always bothered me that all this money is being made. And when, when a player said, well, how come we can't participate in, in this business? They would say, hey, if you want to get a job, go get one. So they were actually okay with us working and getting paid, just not working and getting paid in the industry that they're getting paid in. And I didn't, I didn't care for it. I never understood the, the difference between being an athlete and being a student. And I never understood why somebody would say, well, you are getting paid, you're getting a scholarship. And I'm sitting next to a student, a non-athlete student that's on scholarship. I'm going, well, how, nobody's telling that person what they can earn or accept. They can talk to, to boosters and they can talk to alums and get jobs from them, but I can't. Like, why, that's not right. And what, what are we doing here? It, it, none of this... Amateurism never helped me. It didn't make me a better person, didn't make me a better student, didn't make me a better athlete. It just restricted me. And, and I didn't see the, the harm and I still don't. Um, and then as I got older and I got into broadcasting, so th this one was a hurdle for me. So when I was on that committee, I would, I would speak out in meetings 
and get shot down, whether it was uh, allowing more benefits or transfer rules, whatever it was, I get shot down. But I would be a good soldier when I went out in the public. Like the committee made a decision, the NCAA made a decision, I'm supporting that. Um, and so I did that. But when I got to be a broadcaster, I started thinking, well, wait a minute. I'm criticizing officials when they make a mistake. I criticize coaches. I criticize players. I criticize the rules of play if I don't like them. Why don't we have a shot clock? Why don't we have this? All that stuff. And I'm keeping my mouth shut on NCAA policy when it's time to discuss it. Not in a game, but, you know, other times. Right. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to start talking about this and I'm going to start sharing my thoughts on it and it's going to be informed and hopefully it's going to be right. And, and I, I felt like the NCAA had been violating federal antitrust law forever. And, uh, and I said that, and now the, the Supreme court has said it too. And it, the Supreme court carries a little bit more weight. Jay, how do you think it's going to work? And I just curious, like in a, in a, in a setting where, you know, a kid's coming out of high school, he's a hot shot, and, and maybe it's easier in basketball to control because you have smaller people, but in a big locker room and a football deal, you have kind of definitely some some stars and then some guys that, you know, the, the left guard might not be getting the same love as a, as a starting quarterback or what have you. How do you anticipate this happening? How, how do you see kids getting paid? Like, is it the local car dealer saying, hey, Timmy, we'd like you to be on a billboard and we'll give you X amount. Or is it Nike on a bigger scale paying an individual player? How do you see it? I know it's going to be the Wild West for a little while until they figure it out. But I'm just curious kind of conceptually how you see it all unfolding. Well, and, and, and your question is revealing in how we have been conditioned to look at this. So uh, first you say, how are we going to control this? Well, we don't need to control it because we don't control any other aspect of this business. We're not asking, how do we control coaches pay? How do we control facilities spending? How do we control travel? We don't ask that. So what I would say, Cooper, is the way, I, the way we are looking at it, the uh, way we should look at it is it's the free market, just like everything else, and it'll work itself out just fine. Uh, and, and because we're not asking, you know, how are we going to deal with all these different players of different ability levels when it comes to playing time? Because the quarterback is going to play more, the starting quarterback is going to play more than the second and third string quarterback. And that's not really fair because the second and third string quarterback, they work just as hard. And what about their feelings? You know, we don't, we don't worry about that. We don't worry about not every player and not every athlete in, in uh, college sports gets a scholarship. In fact, most athletes don't. And we're not worried about the inequities there. But man, when money comes in, it has to be all the same and there's going to be fights in the locker room. Not, not that you're saying that, but, but a lot of people are. Right. And I've never bought that. Like, I, I think sports is the ultimate meritocracy. Um, I, I knew who the best player on my team was and I did not resent uh, uh, the fact, he should have gotten yelled at more, but I did not resent um, you know, anything that, that he got uh, relative to me because I knew it was fair. Um, and I don't anticipate any more problems than there would be problems in the coach's locker room because the assistants don't get paid as much as the head guy. I, I don't think that's as, that's as big of a deal. But I do think that once we get over this mental hurdle of it's never been this way before, there's always been this bright line. You know, I, I mean, I, I hate to do this, but you go back to the virginity example and, and you say, do you really believe that every couple that's get, getting married are virgins? And, and would, we, would we be shocked to know that they've actually Strayed. been with each other before? Um, you know, like, come on, man, we, we've created this ridiculous fiction. Let's just get rid of it because we've never asked any of these, like there, there's going to be drastic change. It feels like drastic change because there's been so much inaction over the years. But, you know, from the time you got, you played and I played to now, there's been incredibly drastic change on the revenue generation side. You know, like, like we played in the eighties. So back then our coaches made less than a hundred thousand dollars. They're all making millions upon millions now. And nobody said, Hey, we need to pump the brakes here. This is not what this is all about. We need to, we need to recalibrate this. But now with regard to the athlete, there's, there's worry about that. And, and I, for one, am not worried about it. I think it'll be just fine. Uh, and it'll be above board and honest. And we're not going to be policing. Did this guy take get a tattoo? Did this guy get this for free? Yeah. Did he get a Did he get a discount at the local Foot Locker? Who cares? I mean, right. let, let's just let's just like you know this, that's normal human behavior. Let's stop criminalizing that 
and uh, and deal with the real stuff, which is if you step out of bounds, it's my ball. And, you know, if, if you foul me on a three pointer, get three free throws and move on. Jay, do you think it's going to be big in recruiting? You think they'll have packages say, hey, if you're going to Auburn, you're going to we got, you know, forty thousand dollars worth of stuff for this you know, outside linebacker. And then you go to Georgia, he goes, hey, Auburn's promised me 40. Can we do something bigger? Is it going to be a bidding war? And then also, do you think there's some schools that are maybe less relevant right now that might be able to get into the game because of their resources more so than others? Yes. Um, uh, to the second part of the question, yes. So the, the first part, is it going to go into recruiting? Yes. Um, just like now a media guide talks more about how many pros, how many NFL and NBA players they have than it does about telling you about the current players. Th th those media guides now are for recruiting. Um, so they sell the NFL, the NBA now. How can we can get you there? That wasn't part of the conversation when we were playing uh, because it wasn't as big. It's a big issue now. Uh, and that's fine uh, because you can get educated and uh, pursue a professional dream at the same time. Those things aren't mutually exclusive. We don't tell that to, uh, we're not telling a musician, hey, you know, only 2% of musicians ever play at Carnegie Hall. I mean, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, we don't do that. We only do it with athletes. Uh, so we are going to see, um, you know, and, and the NCAA and the conferences can, and I think it's going to be at the conference level, can come up with rules whether they want uh, their schools setting up uh endorsement opportunities for their players and, and participating i think in the long run what we're going to find is that the use of the university mark the logo and the player name and likeness are going to be really valuable to the university it's going to open up revenue streams they're going to want to do it and that's going to be okay there'll, there'll be nothing wrong with that um and, and but i don't see it being a a major problem going forward i think we'll just have to adjust our mindset to it uh, uh, and, but the, 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 I think the second part of your question will, will, uh, schools that haven't been as competitive, will, will it make them less or more competitive? Here's the way I look at it. So if you, if you took, uh, I mentioned Kansas before. So if you took Kansas and Wichita state in basketball, Wichita state has little or no opportunity to get anybody that Kansas is recruiting out of high school. If they could pay or provide endorsement opportunities, then Kansas's third best recruit, uh, Wichita State could provide them more as their top recruit than Kansas could as their third. So, so th there'll be a decision point for a player to make. Would I rather make more money at Wichita State than I, th or be the third wheel at Kansas? Just like you would with playing time. But they can offer, like money may be a little bit different. But I don't think, like some of the narrative now is, well, Alabama is just going to be the best team in football. Well, first of all, they're the best team now because yeah. you can't pay. Um, but they, they make it seem like every good player is going to go to Alabama now because Alabama may have the most, most money. But you're not going it, to – it's been proven already. Jalen Hurts and Tua Tungavailoa are not going to be on the same team because nobody is going to sit. They're going to go somewhere else. And same thing, like if that theory were true – then, um, uh, you know, Nick Saban, Dabo Sweeney, uh, Ryan Day, they'd all be on the same coaching staff at Alabama, but they, they, they want to be head coaches. It's different. So I don't think we have to worry about as many of these things, but, and we certainly don't need to worry about competitive balance because there is none now. There's none in football and there's none in basketball. We have some upsets, but we don't have competitive balance across the board. As always, we take a little bite of the soup at the end, probably good and cold, and we give it a ranking from one to 1,000. And uh, how did your new end clam chatter taste at the end of an interview? 1,000 because I made it. Uh, but, you know, Cooper, I, I mean, I feel for you because I have eaten a substantial soup here, so I'm going to be satisfied for a good part of the day before I have my next meal. You ate kind of a watery, you know, chicken-based soup. <laughs> that you're going to have to go out and grab something to eat right now. You're going to have to go out and get a burger or something to tide you over until later. So I'm, I'm the big winner here again. It's rarely someone ends our show satisfied. So I'm, I'm thrilled to have <laughs> you're, you're one of many. So one of few, I should say. Jay, it's been a pleasure. Can't thank you enough for joining us. And uh, I'll see you around. Looking forward to it, Coop. Thanks, bud. You bet.